research led me to the study of the spiritual forces with which all of us are blessed. And it was in this field that I came upon a clue which has enabled me to help millions of people to find their earthly destinies. From the time it was first published so many years ago, this inspirational classic has sold over one million copies per year. All success begins with definiteness of purpose with a clear picture in your mind of precisely what you want from life. And ever since Mr. Hill's passing, there has been a foundation that has overseen his teachings, making sure that they are shared and protected throughout the world. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. As you can imagine, each year, this group receives countless requests to team with such an organization with little or no success, until now. Seeing the opportunity to bring Hill's messages into modern terminology, they have agreed to collaborate on the first ever parable based on his principles. What you are about to watch is the behind-the-scenes making of this historic project. Through this journey, you will witness the joy, the struggle, and the challenges that arise in creating any worthwhile endeavor as the authors travel across the country interviewing the greatest leaders of our generation. As you will see, the difference between failing and succeeding is simply the difference between giving up and staying the course. Keep digging. Never quit. Always keep digging and always keep trying. Keep digging. And the way to keep digging is the people you meet and the books you read. That'll keep you digging and you'll never, never give up. Have you ever wondered why so many fail or will they succeed? The opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity. Every one of us are an example. We talk our ourselves out of more things than we could ever imagine. Leadership requires boldness, boldness requires risk. Risk means that you're going to lose. If you're unable to take a risk, you can't fail, but you also can't succeed. It is true that whatever your mind feeds upon, your mind attracts to you. Just understand, you can't quit. Back in 1937, a classic book was published, Think and Grow Rich, by the late great Napoleon Hill. Under the tutelage of his mentor at that time, Mr. Carnegie, he set out on a mission to interview and pick the brains of the era's top leaders. He went to Edison, Bell, Henry Ford to find out exactly what they did, create a life of sustained abundance. Well, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to team up with the Napoleon Hill Foundation and set out on a journey to go interview today's top leaders, today's movers and shakers, to find out not only all their success principles, but here's something very special. How did they handle the adversities that came their way? You see, it's easy to be happy-go-lucky when everything's going your direction, but it's when the chips are down, you learn everything about a character of a person. So that's what this mission is about. And I invite you to join me to go talk to these people to find out exactly why they didn't quit three feet from gold. In 1908, Mr. Carnegie, the richest man of the era, invited Hill to his mansion. During this meeting, Carnegie offered Napoleon a letter that would introduce him to the greatest leaders of that time. Hey, come here. You gotta check this out. We just got an email in from the Napoleon Hill Foundation, and they're sending a hard copy right behind it. It says, with this letter, we're happy to confirm our exclusive agreement to move forward with this exciting and important project, Three Feet from Gold. Based on the teaching of the late Mr. Hill's classic work, Think and Grow Rich, the Napoleon Hill Foundation has years of experience in educating and inspiring literally millions of individuals across the globe. And with this collaboration, we expect this movement to continue exponentially. Thank you for your dedication toward the betterment of mankind, and welcome to the Napoleon Hill family with regard to Don Green, Napoleon Hill Foundation. <laughs> that wild. 
Wow. You know what that means? I mean, think about this. It was exactly 100 years ago in 1908 that Napoleon Hill got a letter that introduced him to the greatest icons of that era. 100 years later, 2008, we just received a letter, the same thing, opening the doors to go talk to today's leaders, today's movers and shakers. Oh my gosh. <sighs> wow. All success begins with definiteness of purpose, with a clear picture in your mind of precisely what you want from life. The message begins in the very first chapter called Three Feet from Gold. It's based on a character named R.U. Darby who sets out west to strike gold. You know, he was smitten to the gold book. He went over and he found a mine and started digging and sure enough discovered a little bit of nuggets. And it goes real good at first. He, uh, he uncovers a, uh, a pretty good hunk of gold. But all of a sudden, it ran out. But they kept digging, there was no more gold. They kept digging, there was no more gold. They did this day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until finally, defeated, Darby gives up and says, I'm quit. So disheartened, like most other people would do, was he quit. There's a junk man walking by and says, hey buddy, you want the gold mine? In fact, I'll sell you the mine and all the equipment for just 200 hours. The jump man got an engineer. He comes in and looks at it and says, this is what we call a fault line. Gold runs in a vein, kind of like a finger. What this other guy did was tap in one side, discovered gold, and came out the other. That's why they ran out. He said, if you go right back to where they discovered the treasure, go three feet in the opposite direction, you'll tap back into it also. Found the gold within three foot of work. Darby had quit, and the guy pulled millions of dollars out of it. Teaching us how many times have we quit just three feet away from our dream as well? How many people quit one class short of a college degree, or they quit sales, or their marriage, or any other type of thing? The bottom line is this, the people that truly succeed in life are those that don't give up. They don't quit three feet from gold. My first assignment was to interview the great Andrew Carnegie, founder of the United States Steel Corporation. Mr. Carnegie at that time was the richest man in the world. He said, now I've been talking to you for approximately three days about this new philosophy. I've told you all that I know about it. I've told you of its possibilities, and now I wish to ask you a question, and I want you to answer that question with a simple yes or no, but don't answer until you make up your mind which it is. If I commission you to become the author of this success philosophy, give you letters of introduction that will open doors to you you will have to have opened, are you willing to devote 20 years to research, because that's about how long it will take? I said, Mr. Carnegie, I not only will accept the commission you have offered me, sir, but you may depend upon it that I will complete it. If he grabbed me by the hand, he said, I not only like what you said, but I like the way you said it. You've got me. Go. And so, the journey begins. Don Green sent us on our first task to meet with Dave Leninger, co-founder and creator of Remax Real Estate. That right there, lesson number one, did you have like family guidance and things of that nature that taught you these golden rules? No. I had a book, Think and Grow Rich. Nice! <laughs> and the, uh, I'd read the book when I was 16 years old. Young, naive, stupid, but it made sense. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, you can achieve. Absolutely. Have a written goal, making an obsession. I said, what was it like the first few years? And he looks at me and he goes, it was brutal. With about 600000 in debt, Financial backers had backed out. We started in the recession of 73. Housing was collapsing. Wow. And everything that we could do wrong, we were doing wrong on our own. And yet, we just said, we can make it one more day. We will not quit. He said, for the first two years, it sounded like every phone call that came in was from another bill collector. And on the third year, every letter he received had three titles on it from another law firm threatening to sue him. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you deal with it? And I might have had 
500 creditors, some I owed 10,000 to, some we owed $50 to. But we called them and said, we're not gonna quit, we're not going out of business, wow. and somehow I'll pay you $5 this week, and I'll pay you $5 next week, and someday I'll pay you $50 this week. Don't give up on me. I won't quit, I promise you, I will not file bankruptcy. If I had quit then, what would have happened to Remix? There's a hundred and some thousand people's lives who are made better because the company became successful. We changed the entire real estate industry. We changed all these things. We don't have to worry about what would have happened to my wealth because I didn't count. Right. But the impact we would have had on tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people would have been lost. Right. We don't even know if there's scientists that are gonna quit three feet away from the cure to cancer That's or right. the next thing. And it's so amazing. So the one suggestion that you would keep continuing to other people and sharing with them is not to quit three feet from gold. Not to quit, not to quit, not to ever quit. No matter what. That's right. Driving up to Caltech, we got to sit down with John Schwartz, and he's co-creator of something that is known as string theory. Now, this is really neat. They used to think back in the day that an atom was the smallest molecular structure they could come up with. Until they cut it in half, you get nuclear fission. And then they theorized that something that's even smaller are these little things called quarks. But what holds quarks together? And the concept that John and Dr. Green came up with was everything rests on these little strings. And more importantly, these strings, they resonate, kind of like a guitar string, and they all vibrate at a different frequency. Here are some Meyer lemons from our own tree. Kind of like that, if I can only juggle, <laughs> right? <laughs> we asked him, did everyone support your beliefs right away? Somewhat to our surprise, uh, the community did not get enthusiastic about it. And so for, for a whole decade, uh, I worked with just a small handful of collaborators. And then in 1984, uh, Michael Green and I had a breakthrough in developing these ideas. And almost overnight, the subject became extremely popular and active. Mm. So, so that was really a very dramatic uh, episode. But there was this 10-year period uh, where we were really kind of working in the wilderness, so to speak. 10 years. I mean, think about it for a second. How many people do you know that would stay with their dreams and aspirations for an entire decade when everyone else is against you? And I remember I asked him, what made you keep going through all that dark time? Well, I felt the way I'm different is that what I was doing was right. <laughs> Message being, never let another person dictate what you can and cannot do. Which leads us to our next interview with Julie Crone. ESPN called her Female Athlete of the Year. All right, so let me tell this story. I really like it because it's about being consistent and persistent. See, Julie wanted to be the best jockey out there, so she went to the top owner and said, I want to ride for you. I enjoy talking to you and you're lovely to be around, he said, but I will never ride a girl on a horse. Wow. And I looked at him and there was something inside of me that said, dude, you just painted a bullseye on your head. <laughs> I said, because you are going down, pal. I was like, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but she wouldn't take no for an answer. One time, one guy was like, are you, are you going to show up every day? Because if you show up every day, I'll put you on a horse just to make you go away. Because she was so consistent, that man, the owner, finally came to his senses and said yes. I walk up to him and I tell him a joke that day. And I said, OK, Mr. Beach, have a nice day. And he goes, Julie? And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, have your agent come by and see me. And then he goes, eh, eh, eh. He goes like that, because he didn't want me to say it. Well, he goes, don't say a word. <laughs> How's the book coming along? Hey, really, really good. In fact, now that we have these interviews in the can, what we're gonna do is figure out what we're gonna do with it. So we just had a powwow with all the powers that be and decided that we're gonna create a book which is uh, based on a parable. We're gonna make a fake, fictitious story and interweave all the messages from these real life leaders. What about the process? Well, it's like anything else, there's a system to it. You know, once we have this set, we have the story outline, it's called the manuscript. Then we need to do is get a agency that will go to New York and start pitching us to all the big time publishers. Okay, and last thing, what about that stick? Well, first of all, this is my fancy travel case right here. <laughs> Full trash bag. But the concept was easy. When, when we decided to go out and film all these people, we had to come up with some type of a hook or, you know, a shtick. 
And what we did is came up with a three foot ruler representing three feet from gold. And every person that we interview, what we're gonna do is have them sign it. When we're done, we're gonna have a little piece of history. Nice. You know, a little known fact is Napoleon Hill never received a penny while he was making Think and Grow Rich. Well, the great news is the Napoleon Hill Foundation, they're paying us the exact same wage. We're gonna have to get creative. What would you have said if you had been sitting there in front of that great man who had asked you to go to work for him for 20 years without compensation? I could think of all the reasons in the world why I couldn't possibly accept that opportunity. I tried to open my mouth to tell Mr. Carnegie why I couldn't do it. I had in mind at least five or six good reasons, but something inside of me stayed my tongue. I said, Mr. Carnegie, I not only will accept the commission you have offered me, sir, but you may depend upon it that I will complete it. He grabbed me to the hand. He said, I not only like what you said, but I like the way you said it. You've got the job. Realizing they would need capital to continue the journey, the hunt for investors began. So I called up Julie, our right-hand person. I said, Julie, what do you think we should do? Should we even go up there? And she said, yeah. She goes, look, if I was investing money, I'd want to have a big powwow meeting to ask questions before I did it. And I said, well, that makes sense as well. So what we're going to do is meet with some potential investors right now and share the Three Feet from Gold project with them. Understand that it's going to cost quite a little bit of a chunk of change to go around the United States for airline tickets, hotel stay, or car rentals, etc. And what we're going to do is see if we can find a partner to team up with that sees the big picture and wants to be part of this historic project. So let's see what we can pull off. Okay, plan B. <laughs> that didn't work out exactly the way that we hoped it to be. But uh, the bottom line is we got some encouraging words that uh, they're very excited about the project and wish us the best. However, the project wasn't exactly right for them. What can you do? Keep digging, you're only three feet from gold. Well, thank you anyway. Okay, bye. So no, hmm. what can you do? Okay, well, if there's anything I can do to uh, serve you or change your mind, give us a call. She says if nothing else, we go up there and we get the learning experience of pitching it and we get to see what we sound like. So she put together a little portfolio here. So we're going to go up there and talk to these people and just give it a shot and then that's it. Either they come through or the other odd thing is that we'll do is we'll just go in a different direction and just go for uh, some funding in ourselves and making it happen and keep it in the family, keep it afloat. Well, that didn't work out quite as well as it went as well. In fact, we got the Heisman from our very last uh, investor opportunity. Well, what's the Heisman? You know, the Heisman. <laughs> they said, thanks, but it's not right for them. So we're going to go a different strategy now. After exhausting all immediate opportunities, the team decided to fund the project from their own pocket so they could move forward and continue the quest. Hey, do you think we can get someone to take AAA? Uh, in fact, woohoo! We got a call from Charlie Tremendous Jones, a great friend and ally and mentor of ours. And he's doing a speaking engagement out in Las Vegas. Asked us to come out and talk to him there because he had some great leads for us. So let's see what happens. Charlie and Boya have six children, but they never tell you why. We only have six. The reason we only have six children is my wife hates kids. That's why. <laughs> then, they always tell you, we have seven grandchildren, but they never tell you, they're all boys, except five. Who <laughs> is here with me, she's out shopping as usual, but she and I will be January 29th this year, married 60 years. <laughs> Charlie for you. A lot of people don't know this, but right after that event, he actually lost his voice. And he had to go out on a world tour, and he calls me up from Malaysia and says, Greg, he goes, I lost my voice. Great news. <laughs> Charlie, how could that possibly be great news? He says, now, every time he gets on stage, he has to whisper into the microphone. But what happens is the crowd gets silent and actually listens to what he has to say. He goes, I should have lost my voice years ago. 
That's Charlie. Always making the best out of every situation. And another thing he did for us was open up some doors to go meet some incredible people. One of his close, dear friends and allies is Truett Cathy, founder of Chick-fil-A restaurants. And flying out to Atlanta, Georgia, we had an opportunity to tour the entire facility. This place was incredible, five stories tall, and Truett gave a private tour. We went downstairs and looked through his museum, where they documented the entire process of the franchise, and even gave a little sneak peek of his car collection. Gosh, things have changed since 1920. A little bit. I really wanted to ask him this one question. So, did, did, did you ever meet the colonel? I did. And he was sitting in that county eating this chicken sandwich. The real man asked him, said, Colonel, now, isn't that the best chicken you ever eaten? He said, second best. <laughs> I was going to say, you had to say that. <laughs> oh, my. What really took me by surprise was a response I got. When I asked him a question, I go, true it? He goes, what's the one secret toward success? And he looks at me and he goes, don't plan. My life seems like it's been created by uh, unexpected opportunities. I never planned on chick fil a it just happened. He looks at me and he says, uh, great. He goes, last year, I bet you made a lot of plans. I go, yeah. He goes, well, how many of those worked out for you? He goes, not many. He goes, five years ago, I bet you made a lot of plans. I go, yeah, I sure did. He goes, well, how many of those worked out? Not one. My children said, Dad, let's plan where we're going to be five years from now, ten years from now. I said, well, just be, uh, take advantage of unexpected opportunities because they're out there. Now, the end result might have happened. In fact, you might have even hit your goal. Because, but I guarantee the way that it went down didn't go as planned. And he says, it's kind of like this. Imagine you had a goal to get to the end of the street. You know, that's the destination in mind says what a strategizer is going to do is they're going to plan every single step, you know, when they're going to pause, when they're going to take a break. He goes, but an opportunist will do something special and they're going to look for hidden opportunities along the way. Like did a kid leave a skateboard out or a bicycle and make their journey shorter. He goes, if I get really lucky, what I'm going to do is wave down a neighbor as they're driving by and hop a lift to the end of the street. Either way, I'm going to reach my destination. I'm going to hit my goal. I just don't know how it's going to happen. I learned this from Napoleon Hill. Anything you can conceive and believe can achieve. Yeah. And I believe that. That uh, book, Napoleon Hill, Thinking Grow Rich. I'm not rich yet, but I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> and I like the name. Charlie calls up and says, hey, there's someone else I need you to meet with right away. And good news, he's right in your own backyard. He used to run a multi-billion dollar trust for a little company I think you might have heard of. So we're right here out in Palm Springs, California. This is the home of Ron Glosser. You're going to love this. Hey, hey. Man. Hey, great, great, to, great see to see you. you. How are you doing? Oh. All right, so where are we now? Well, this, this is where I hang out during the daytime, try to think some reasonable. No, this is where you take your naps. Where are you talking? <laughs> about? Uh, you know what I'm also hearing is that you expect things to happen. So almost like you know, it's it's as acting as it. Yeah, I think that's always the case with me. Do you think if more people adopted that philosophy, they'd have different results? I don't think there's any question about it, and I have to challenge people. What's the downside? It's so important to act as if you've already accomplished your goals. It's so important, faced with the challenges of life, that you keep digging. The results are just about to happen. From there, interviews began pouring in, traveling across the country. I'm here in Dallas, Palm Springs, California, Georgia, Las Vegas. And we're here in Waco, Texas. Okay, side note. During all these travels, I also realized why California real estate is so darn expensive. Hey, Greg, how'd the trip go? Greg, <laughs> what are you doing, man? man I'm tired. I just did 20 interviews. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just put together some uh, great little stories from. How about that? Man, that was just, what, 10,000 miles? Got a lot of frequent flyer miles? 
each new leader shared their insights. That helped further the project exponentially. And he, can't, he hasn't beaten a 71-year-old man yet. <laughs> Look, I know we've got a lot of great stuff, but it's impossible to do. We can't use every single piece. Okay, I hear what you're saying, but I'm gonna use the director override on this one and veto you because this is a great nugget. With over 30 hours of dialogue, they sifted through the footage to uncover wisdom that would be used to create the book. If you have to wonder if it's right or wrong, it most likely is gonna be wrong. So living an uncommon life is doing common things over and over again to get an uncommon result. There's no magic to that. Although, there were a few challenges along the way. Now we're doing a project actually with the Napoleon Hill Foundation called Three Feet From... Yeah. Okay. I hear you, I just wanted to be able to... Thanks for your time. Okay. Well, we got a decline email today from Herb Keller's office. He's the guy who started at Southwest Airlines. And this is the nicest rejection I've ever got in my life. I wish my ex-girlfriends could be this polite. Oh man, I really wanted this person to be part of the project, and I just can't make it. Right. And although we couldn't get everybody, we did put together a dream team of some incredible leaders. Are there setbacks in business? Well, it means that often it takes, you know, three, four, five years or so before you find out whether you're a hero or an idiot. But there's always someone there to tell you either way. Sometimes the winters are a little bit longer, and sometimes the summers are a little bit longer, but it's always there. Sometimes the one season might be a little bit longer, which would shorten up the next one, but it always does come back. And I think that's the way all businesses are too. Most companies make their greatest steps forward for achievements in the toughest of times. Now, it may not make the most money, but it's then when they make the course corrections, they become introspective, they tighten up their activity, and that becomes a foundation for all that happens going forward. We're here at Minute Maid Park to meet with Drayton McLean, owner of the Houston Astros. This is a trophy that shows the championships that the Houston Astros have won and First one was 1980 and then 86, and all the rest we've won since we've owned, owned the team. And sometimes the worst situations turn out to be the best opportunity. But to be able to maintain a positive outlook, you know, in the midst of life's most difficult situations, is what has continued to keep me going. There's no such a thing as a failure. It's just a learning experience. Right. You just bounce back and... Unless you quit. That's right. right. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Look at this. Okay, Journey to Success with Napoleon Hill, the 2008 calendar. But here's the best part. Hold on, drum roll please. What? If you're looking right here, it says this part here. Don't stop with just a few, or in Dr. Hill's words, three feet from gold. How cool is that? The 2008 calendar, the 2008 calendar for Napoleon Hill is uh, in conjunction with the three feet from gold project. This is getting exciting, huh? Woohoo! The accumulation of great fortunes calls for power. And power is acquired through highly organized and intelligently directed specialized knowledge. But that knowledge does not have to be in the possession of the person who accumulates the fortune. In other words, you don't have to know everything. What you need is a team of brilliant people around you who are following the vision that you create. And you'll create. So instead of selling, again, five billion people Velcro, you sold five people Velcro, like the head of the automotive industry, That's the right. head of the uh, aerospace, the head With of the home, home furnishings, uh, clothing, medical. Did you get that? He didn't sell five billion people Velcro. He only sold five people. See, Jack truly understood the power of leverage. It wasn't a matter of going out and selling everyone in the universe. It was a matter of getting to those top five people in each of those industries 
and let them find the application that would bring it to the masses. The product would be taken in to an industry, exposed to that industry, and all kinds of things that were medically, let's say, uh, devised uh, would be tried. And those that proved to be correct would be promoted. What I saw was a blueprint to be able to control how I think and so that outside circumstances didn't determine the life that I live. Because the vision comes from those people that can take that extra awareness, make a decision, and, and, and be prophetic with that decision. I'm here in Daytona Beach, Florida to meet with Mike Helton, president of NASCAR. I asked him, I said, Mike, do you have something that you'd like to share with everyone? Maybe something that helped get you through your challenges? Let me show you, Kath. I'm going to give you an idea here. Because I carry these with me, and that's why they look a little bit ragged. This is the one that I, uh, I live by. Okay, Code of the West. Live each day with courage. Take pride in your work. Always finish what you start. Do what has to be done. Be tough, but fair. When you make a promise, keep it. Ride for the brand. Talk less and say more. Remember that some things aren't for sale. And number 10, here's a good one. Know where to draw the line. Now you see why it is important that you recognize that all success begins with definiteness of purpose, with a clear picture in your mind of precisely what you want from life. If you're not making the progress you would like to and are capable, it's simply because your goals are not clearly defined. Uh, you don't have to be a, a Harvard graduate to, to be successful. You don't have to have a, a lineage of credentials or a, an education, a wall full of plaques and certificates and everything to be successful. God gave me something that I need to develop my skill, my talent to the most limit of my potential. I look around at successful people and, and I look around at successful moves that, that have been made. All right, I'll see you there. Bye. Talk about following the action successful people. You realize I've invited over 50 individuals to come watch the filming of all these great leaders. And out of those 50 people, only three ever showed up. A guy named George, Jose, and one of my closest dear friends, Ruben Gonzalez. Okay, now we're in Houston, Texas with, what do you know? Ruben Gonzalez. Hey, hey. He understood the power of what we were onto, so much so that he actually even took plane rides all around the country to come meet some of these champions. This is for you, this is a gift. This is a, a book I wrote, it's called The Courage to Succeed. Uh, Zig wrote the introduction. Out of all the incredible people that we interviewed along this journey, it was amazing to find that many of them said the exact same thing. They said 50% of all success is simply showing up. And if that's the case and is true, you gotta ask yourself, would you have been one of the three that actually did? And now we find ourselves in Spain of all places. In Pamplona, we just got done running with the bulls. That was so awesome. Talk about suiting up and showing up for experiencing life rather than just watching it go by. This is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. Look at the energy. There's a million people in the city today, and only 3,000 will be running with the Bulls. Just like in life, only 1% is out there doing it, 99% are watching. Now, Ruben, you've been a three-time world Olympian, and you're going on four times. That's right. I did three Olympics in the luge, hurling down that icy chute 80 miles an hour, and I'm working on number four. Right, and you'll be the first person in history to do four winter Olympics in four different decades. That's right. Breaking the Guinness Book of World Records. Kind of like that. I hope that's all I break. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
One of the cool things is you pick the luge, and that's sliding down an ice sheet in like, what? 80, 90 miles an hour. Absolutely crazy. And one of the things I like most about you is that you said you were a great athlete as a kid. <laughs> I was the last kid picked for PE all my life. I wasn't a great athlete. So how did you pick the luge? Well, it looked like a lot of broken bones. It looks like all you have to do is, is not quit when everybody else is quitting. What a concept, huh? So basically you rode the attrition rate to success. Absolutely, and that'll work for everything. Uh, and you say there's two types of courage to make in this world. What is that? Well, you gotta have the courage to get started. And once you get started, you gotta have the courage to not quit. Think about it, three feet from gold. After returning to the States, the team finalized their transcript and prepared for their trip to New York. We're heading on out to New York City where our literary agent set us up with some meetings with some top people in the industry. Don Green will be flying out from his home state to meet us there. It's getting exciting. Our trip to New York wasn't as fruitful as we had hoped and expected. What's great is we did not get turned down by every publisher that we went out to meet with. Nope, in fact, most of them canceled their appointment and didn't even want to meet with us in the first place. <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh my, but it was interesting. I got on the phone and started calling back home to all my other author friends and to find out that we're not alone. In fact, Chicken Soup for the Soul and Rich Dad Poor Dad and One Minute Manager, almost all the great literary works got turned down the first go around. So we're in pretty good company. The trip wasn't a total loss. The foundation did receive an offer. However, it wasn't exactly what the foundation was looking for. Returning to San Diego, I called one of my first mentors, David Corbin, and he said, great, you just need to illuminate the negative. But illuminate the negative says, you know, whereas we should accentuate the positive, we shouldn't go into avoidance hmm. or denial of the negative. We should face it, have the character to confront it and go right into it. That makes sense. Running away. Well, it's, it's kind of like what you're talking about. If, you know, if you got cancer, you can't sit there and say, uh, I don't have it because I got a great attitude. You got to go, I got cancer. You got to deal with it so you can fix it. Good example. So if you have, God forbid, a melanoma or something like that, if you put a band aid over it, you're in avoidance, man. It's not going to go away. We say have the character and the courage to pull the, to take a look at it and work on it. Mm. There's a philosopher, he said, he says, you can't solve every uh, problem that you face, but you can't solve any of them unless you face them. That's the illumination. That's a great quote right there. You know, Frank, you're really on to something special here, and maybe the project's bigger than just you. Perhaps you need a co-author. So I gave Don a call and said, what do you think? And he said, I got to agree. And just as the moral and the message that we're sharing, we thought we'd apply it ourselves. And one of the major things is seek expert advice and counsel with people that have expertise outside your own. So who did we get? Sharon Lecter, co-author of the Rich Dad Poor Dad book series, selling over 26 million copies worldwide. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> That's a happy kid right there. See, this is my James Bond car. The little part of me that people don't see. Holy smokes! Isn't she pretty? Number 37 of 99. How was it the, when the first book came in? and it was hot off the press in a different language, what it make you feel like. It was really cool. It was really cool. In addition to her writing abilities, Sharon brought an incredible list of contacts, some of the publishing world, as well as many of her close personal friends. She even suggested that we contact these two ladies that she knew very well. They founded a, an incredible organization called childhealth.org. Every one of us are an example. So people are watching you. You've talked to them about your dream, you've worked toward the dream, and if you can be a walking example of not giving up, you're going to help other people far more than you ever realized. They're watching to see how you're going to react with your challenges. Are you going to give up? And if you do, they might also, they might think, well, no wonder, and I'm going to do the same thing. But if you don't, they too will persevere. What does the Nobel Peace Prize represent to you? 
you know, there are so many children out there who are hurting that need help, and so there are so many areas. So it just depends on if we win and if we get the prize, what is needed at the time, how we will use it. it just help bring more just, children to safety. That's right. That's great. There are so many hurting children out there. You can huh. always do something. Everyone can do something. There were obstacles that stopped you. What made you blast through them? How, how did you get past them? You know, I was homeless for six months of my life. You know, once you get homeless, what are you going to do to me? I mean, what are you going to do? Tell me no? <laughs> I, mean, I, had, I had no when I walked in the front door. I mean, was that, I mean that's not going to devastate me. Now, for the women out there that right now are sitting feeling about three inches shorter than they really are because right. of the stress and the strife, what, what advice do you have for them? You know, we take on so much. We take on the care of our families, we take care of our friends, we take care of our business associates, and we very, not enough, and we hear it all the time, but it's so true, we don't take care of ourselves. And we constantly put ourselves last on our own to-do list. Well, it's time to move ourselves up to the top of the list. We're on our way back from the airport to go to the Scottsdale Ganey Hyatt Regency to meet with Bob Proctor, one of my absolute all-time favorite people on earth. I have lost everything I own twice. And it would have been so easy to quit. And I thought, nah. And, and I understand, I, I got to the point where I understood there's a lesson in this. Like I wrote the book Born Rich. I had the whole book written and I left it in the back of the cab. I didn't have any my name on it. I had nothing on it. <laughs> you know, my wife said to me, how come you're not upset? And I said, it probably wasn't any good. You know. And I think what this taught me, it taught me that it doesn't matter what happens, there's a lesson in it, and you gotta keep on going. Let me call your attention to a great power which is under your control, said Mr. Carnegie. A power which is greater than poverty, greater than the lack of education, greater than all of your fears and superstitions combined. It is the power to take possession of your own mind and direct it to whatever ends you may desire. I have some old tapes of Hills. You know, he ran around all over the country giving talks. He says, I want to ask you a question. How many times does the average person quit when they start something? Of course, the audience will have three, four, five different numbers out. He said the average is less than one. Because a lot of people that you have to factor in there don't even start. Most people give up three feet from goal. Most people give up before the game even starts. We talk our ourselves out of more things than we could ever imagine. While Sharon was in Arizona making revisions to the book, a few of the experts introduced Greg to Debbie Fields, founder of Mrs. Fields Cookies. When I was 20 years old, I opened up Mrs. Fields Cookies. And we developed a philosophy of excellence, and it was all based on good enough never is. I really believe that you, as a leader, sometimes have to set the standards so high that even the flaws are considered excellent. When something is not working, instead of just going, oh my gosh, I'm afraid of failure, I won't even try, or, you know, I'm in it and I'm failing and it's bad, I see it as being hit by a two by four over your head and it's like, oh, excuse me, but I don't know how to be more obvious, but if you continue doing what you're doing, it's not working. Right. So what you have to do is come up with a different plan and you just keep coming up with another plan. It's like being in quicksand right. and you got to be thinking quickly and rapidly, but you got to find another way. All right. Yeah. And I will be there no matter what. So count on it. Okay, I'll see you then. Bye. Okay. We just got a call from uh, Charlie Tremendous, and he said that his health is fading, and, and he asked for me to go out and see him one last time. He said he had some uh, final words he wanted to embark, and turn them. I'm in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. So the crack of dawn is a little bit early for me, but I'm at the home and the estate 
one of my favorite people of all time, Charlie Tremendous Jones. I'm gonna give you a quick tour and show you around. A bunch of awards and plaques and letters from presidents of the United States. All of his honors and awards, it just keeps going and going and going. He's got bookshelves and rooms, hallways. Everywhere you go, there's more items honoring Charlie Tremendous. What a legend. Look at that. Who's that good looking guy? This is his private library. There's our good buddy. Who's that? Huh. Okay. Here's the deal. I get to take 10 books. But the question is, which 10 will it be? I got a lot of work ahead of me. Here's what we picked. First, Think and Grow Rich, the first version. Oh, ha, 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 ha. Uh -huh. you got a good <laughs> stop. <laughs> is that a good one? This one was pretty interesting. And this is, says, the public speaker's treasure chest. Oh, this is not a journal. I used this many, many times. Oh, that's great. I just thought it'd be kind of neat. And then this one is just for entertainment value, The Sinking of the Titanic. Oh, right? what Seek a neat disasters. book. <laughs> yeah, you know, you need money. Just raise some money on eBay. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, you saw that line already. That's great. <laughs> As you can see, Charlie is pretty weak. And, you know, I just don't want to waste his time talking about trivial stuff. And on top of that, I don't think it's appropriate to film our last conversation. So that's about the only sneak peek you're going to get at that one. One of the things that I took from that trip was what has been beaten into me my entire life here. It's, it's all about commitment. Commitment is the heart of everything. Commitment. We so, that word is so sacred we shouldn't even say it. Because see, in life, there comes a time you can't go on. You can't go on. But you know when you grow? You don't grow when you can't go on. You grow when you won't give up. And you know when you won't give up? When you're committed and you can't give up. With all the interviews complete, the team goes into final edit of which stories they're going to use. All right, so what's your favorite interview so far? Wow, that's all been pretty good though, huh? <laughs> that's hard, hard to choose. I'll tell you one that I can't get out of my head is the one we did with Evander Holyfield. Really? Yeah, I've been telling the story probably a thousand different times. As he says, you know, every time I get in the ring, I don't focus on winning that fight. I focus on the bigger dream, which is to win the World Heavyweight Championship. He says, so this is just a process to get through it. And he says, when I'm in that ring and I take a blow, he goes, I don't focus on that. Or my competition does. And they go, ow, that hurts. And I realize the second you start focusing on the blows you're going to take, you're going to get knocked out. So when, when you're sitting there and you're in a fight and you're getting beat on, you're focusing though at the end result. You're not really focusing on the punches, right? No, not at all. Not at all. If I did that, then it would become fear because I'd be, I'd be starting to analyze how bad this shot hurt. Right. Which would allow me to hesitate. So people in life, they do the same thing. They focus on gas prices and wars and all the drama. And what happens is they end up on their back because they don't have a clear focus on where they're going. The most important thing is that you have to concentrate on what you're doing, not worry about what someone else. And here's what he said the best part. He goes, at the end of the day, when you win that championship, when you hit that goal, you your eye on the prize, they raise your hand in victory and they shout your name. He says, you never felt even one of the blows that you took along the journey. Wow. He says, but everyone in the losing locker room, all they do is they feel those bumps and bruises for days and days and days, and they always talk about they wish they would have. Okay, so here's a quick update. So far we have all these incredible interviews, we figured out our finance situation, and we even got an agent. We went out to New York, we met with a publisher, we got an offer, and you saw how that went. But I gotta tell you, it seemed like everything really came together. Venus, Pluto, and Mars aligned when we brought Sharon on board. In fact, she even took us to the BEA, which is Book Expo of America, and introduced us to many of the same publishers that turned us down the first go-around. 
they heard through the grapevine what we were working on and they wanted another sneak peek so you gotta like that and now I'm on my way out to Arizona where we're gonna sit down and see what she's done with the manuscript we're gonna go through it word for word and complete the project making it the very best it can be this is what you sent me okay very nice and this is where it is today <laughs> I think she's done a little bit of editing, huh? Amazing. When we're talking about we need more hope. Yeah. It's not just about writing a book. You're right. It's about accomplishing. The book's a book. metaphor. Right. That's all and, it is. And this this chapter is way too much about the book. It needs to be more about accomplishing the goal because that's what this book is all about. It's about taking action. One month later, a journey ends. Going out to visit Sharon was truly fantastic. And while we were there, we got a call from Don, who had a suggestion of his own. He said, you know, rather than making the story about fictional characters, he says, why not just tell the journey what you two are going through right now? So that's exactly what we did, and rewrote the last three chapters. In fact, we just sent them over for review. Hey, Sharon, did you get the uh, last three chapters? Okay, cool. Now, can you uh, do your magic and uh, do your slicing and dicing to that? Absolutely. I'm looking forward to seeing the finished product, and I think we'll have a good winner there. I think it's going to be great. It's going to bring a lot of value to a lot of people. Right on. Now, you're going to send that out once it's done to those publishers that have been asking about it. Yeah, I have about six ready to go. As soon as we have the manuscript done, they're going to go out, and uh, we'll start the process. All right. A reader is not just reading. You want them to experience. So it's as if the reader is having a conversation with the author. Boy, Sharon's quick. You know, the proposals she just sent out last week were already getting responses. One says, we are so excited about the potential of teaming together. The other one says, congratulations on a great project. We look forward to collaborate. The other one says, we're having a meeting this week to discuss Three Feet from Gold. My gosh. I like that. Which one are we going to go with? Well, just like it says in the book, you're going to have to read it and find out. Gosh, it's hard to believe that this entire journey began less than a year ago. Off just a simple little idea. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Regardless of how many times you may have failed in the past, or how lofty your aims and hopes may be. Now that this journey is over for us, it could just be the beginning for you. In fact, you gotta ask yourself, truly, where could we be? Where could you be if you didn't give up on your goals and dreams just because the going got tough? It seems that most people in life quit right before that miracle happens. And one of the lessons that I learned along this process that I'll never forget is we did something crazy, absolutely wild, and practiced what we preached. You see, we didn't stop at the first sign of struggle. In fact, remember that fancy travel case I have, <laughs> the trash bag? Well, we have that yardstick. And what do you know? Voila! Check this out. These are all the incredible leaders that we had an opportunity to sit down with and learn something new. If you believe in what you're doing, just do it. Challenges don't seem like challenges when you know where you're going and what you're going to do. The detours and the problems are what makes life unique. If you can be a walking example of not giving up, you're going to help other people far more than you ever realize. You can do it. It's already inside you. And have the faith to take the next step. It's an internal measurement. Is this the best I can do? Have you done your best thing? You have to believe in yourself. Get yourself a mentor, but just understand, you can't quit. I want to end with less of a challenge and more of a message. Something to really remember and hold on to. Even though I promise that there will be tough times, there will be obstacles, there will be setbacks, all great things come when they're supposed to. And never give up, never quit. Three feet from gold.
never succeed The ones who strike and bitch The ones who persist They never quit No, they never accept defeat Keep on going cause you're the defeat Hey, you cheating? <laughs> wow, here are some Meyer lemons from our own tree. Yeah, I don't like that. If I can only juggle, right? <laughs> people should not walk away from people who don't have a positive attitude. They should run away from them as fast as possible. You ever seen this watermelon? No, no. Never. You'll see it. There it is. Oh, it's not big enough. There it is. Keep digging. Don't give up. And he can't, he hadn't beaten the seventy-one-year-old man yet. Cross <laughs> <laughs> him out. Oh wait, wait, wait. I mean, <laughs> All emails sent. Going. <laughs> no. Top. I'm happy. Yeah. 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 That's not kidding around. <laughs> not make any major decision while you're in your valley. Widen your woes. Yeah. Oh wow, that is great advice. I have to stop myself throughout my daily activities and, and stop my habits that I have and go, wait a second, this person said this and they know I should follow that advice. The person's just picking it up. They want to sit down and ask themselves, what do I want to accomplish? Crystallize what it is they're working towards. And then make up their mind they're going to read the book over and over and over again for at least a year. Don't read anything else, just read that book. Now I know that works because I've done it. Come on, Bob. Go, Sharon, go, Sharon, go. <laughs> when you continually read, you know, three feet from gold, what you're going to do is you're going to frame your mind on a track of thinking where you can't possibly lose. And you've got to stop letting things outside control you and start to get things inside control you because that's where all your power lies and that's what the book is all about. There are no accidents. I was supposed to come into this project and work with you because it gave me sustenance. Right. It gave me fuel and it gave me hope for my own situation. And it gave me courage. Right. Go. Oh. Come on, somebody just put your back into it! <laughs> Today we got that out of it. Been in the publishing business, was it always easy? No. The first big success came about 22 years into the business. And what was that book? And that was a book called The Secret. Wow. In one year, we sold 6 million copies in the United States. Wow. So we were sort of an overnight success, but 23 years in the making. You're not even trying! <laughs> All right, on. you're cheating. I'm gonna tickle you. Yeah. <laughs> always keep digging and always keep trying. That's good. There goes my pipes. <laughs> find out exactly what they did to go from where they were to where they were at that. <laughs> and now I'm on my way, okay. And now I'm on my way out to Arizona where I'm gonna sit, her and I are gonna sit together and really go. I can hear our field wind. Manuscript, we're gonna complete it so that we have a, we're going to get it all completed and laid out so that we can start sending to all these people that we're going to go word for word and make sure it's the best. What the fudge? When I see this, uh, this is in the key of shove. <laughs> and, but that's clean. Wait, wait, wait. This ain't that hard. What's going on? Hey. Hey, is this like paparazzi? Do we have to do this here? Give me one out of the lips. <laughs> <laughs> now that's love. Okay. Don't worry, I don't hug women. Every time I hug my wife, I have a baby. You're not getting one. Go ahead. You gotta admit, it's not a bad job, huh? <laughs>